Hello again. Um, today we are going to be going over chapter two of the Essential Cell Biology book. So this is um, one of those chapters that I've gone over in pieces as part of other lectures, but I've never done it all in one. And this is just basically talking about the chemical components of cells. So it talks about um, the cells at a very molecular level, both in the sense of what they're made of in the form of different atoms and compounds is, you know, and basically goes over the different macromolecules that make up our cells and give us all the biological functions that we have. So as part of this chapter, uh, we are going to be going over uh, just a little bit of a chemistry review and talking about chemical bonds and how they form. And then we're going to be talking about small and large molecules in the cells. So when we think about cells, right, cells are basically just like chemical factories full of lots and lots of chemical reactions. Um, and most of these reactions, as well as the components of the cells, require in some form uh, some organic molecules. Um, a lot of our life is based on carbon compounds, so it is a basic requirement for a living thing in this case. Um, and all these, um, their survival is dependent upon all these chemical reactions that are taking place inside these cells to maintain their temperature or to do the metabolism, to provide energy, um, all the good stuff. The molecules that are inside these cells are basically polymers. And polymers are um, the basic molecules that we have, at least are polymers. And polymers basically have a smaller subunit that is repeated multiple times, twice or more, uh, to create a larger molecule that can actually perform work. And all these chemical reactions and how much of each polymer or molecule is present there is very tightly regulated inside the cell. So starting from the most basic level, um, elements uh, are the basic structural component at the end of the day that are made of atoms. Um, an element is a substance that cannot be broken down or interconverted uh, by chemical means. So that's your basic unit of a chemical reaction at the end of the day. It is the smallest particle of an element um, that still retains very distinctive properties. Now, yes, we have quarks and gluons and all those other, you know, subatomic particles as well. However, um, we are going to be talking about elements and beyond. So the elements basically contain of a central, very dense nucleus, which contains the protons and the neutrons. And then it has a cloud of negative electrons that are kind of floating around it, orbiting around it in a very distinct manner. So the basic component inside is that the one that's providing mass to that uh, cell or to that atom is the nucleus. And the nucleus basically contains of protons that are positively charged and neutrons that are neutral charge. An atomic number of an atom is going to be basically the number of protons that are present inside that central nucleus. On the other hand, you can also sometimes look at the mass number or require a mass number for things that we need to do. A mass number is going to be basically most of that weight that that atom contains, which is the neutrons and the protons combined together. So in this case, your atomic number is 6 and the atomic weight is 12 or mass is 12 because that is taking into account both the neutrons and the protons. And then you have these electrons that are going to be circulating around it, orbiting around it in their distinct orbits. Um, these electrons um, are going to, in a normal atom, you're, you're going to have the same number of electrons as protons to keep a neutral charge. So if this has, you know, in a carbon atom, you have six protons, so there'll be six electrons in the orbits. Um, however, those have negligible weight, although they are extremely important in all the interactions that that cell is, uh, that atom is going to have. Another common biological atom is hydrogen. Hydrogen is one of the simplest, simplest atoms. Um, it has one lonely proton 
and one electron. Its atomic number is 1, and its atomic weight is 1, because it does not contain any neutrons in addition to it. So it's just a very, very basic atom, and extremely important because of its simplicity in many, many, many reactions. So um, now, when we are looking at these electrons, the electrons don't all revolve around in the same exact orbit. There is a distinct number of electrons that can be present in any given orbit, and that dictates how much interaction they can have with other uh, atoms around them. Um, so the level at which these uh, electrons reside based on their energy level, right? So the innermost or the lowest energy level is can only accommodate two electrons, and then you have outer shells, and you can have two, three. However, many shells are required to catch all the electrons that need to be there. The outermost shell usually contains eight electrons. Um, outer shell contains, it can accommodate up to eight electrons. So if it does not have eight, then it has the capacity to get those additional ones through interactions with other atoms in order to reach what it is considered a stable state. So the outermost electrons, however many are there, is going to dictate how much an atom interacts and, um, you know, how easily it interacts as well, and also which way it interacts, depending on how many more or less it needs. So a hydrogen atom, for example, has only one electron, but it only has one shell, and that inner shell can only accommodate two electrons, which means that it can only interact, it, all it needs is one more, and it has that shell full, and it is in its very happy state. Um, helium, on the other hand, already has a full orbit. It has two electrons, it does not need any more, so it's going to be inert. It wouldn't be readily amenable to making interactions with other atoms for any reason, because it already has a full stable state. Carbon is, uh, you know, is, uh, is in a way special because it has half full outer shell. It has four electrons and it can have another four. That gives it a lot of possibilities. It can lose four, it can gain four um, to get to a stable state. So it can, it has a lot of options for interactions. It can make up to four bonds and that makes it a very versatile molecule and hence probably the molecule of choice in these biological systems. Then you have um, atoms like you know nitrogen that has five, so it needs three more interactions to get to an eight. So you can get an idea on how it is that you can fill these shells. The same thing is gonna apply for the third electron shell as well, that it can accommodate up to eight and so depending on how many atoms are there, uh, how many electrons are there in that outer shell, and, um, uh, an element will be more likely to either lose those extra ones or gain the extra ones to get to a stable state. So for example, in sodium, it has one extra in that third shell. It's more likely to just lose it than to gain seven more. On the other hand, a chlorine is more likely to gain an additional one and fill that third shell rather than lose them. So that is something to keep in mind, that depending on how many electrons are there in that outer shell, an atom may be more likely to either gain electrons or lose electrons to fill that shell and become a stable state. Now, atoms with unfilled electron with unfilled electron shells um, will participate, will fill that space up or lose the extra ones through chemical bonds. That's how they get to a stable state. They can't just do it on their own. And so they do that in two different ways. They can do it through sharing of the electrons. So they form a bond that is um, a little stable interaction, right? It's where they kind of make a marriage between each other and they hang out together um, and that is called a covalent bond or they can completely take away that electron or gain an electron 
to create ionic bonds, in which case one of the, the atom that has lost the electron will become a positive ion, and the um, electron, uh, the atom that has gained the electron, that has stripped away the electron from the other, will now have an extra negative charge, so will be a negative ion. Uh, so that's essentially both of them are leading to the same end that they are trying to get to a stable state. Um, but it depends on how that interaction is happening, whether it is through this, you know, kind of commingling of these two electron shells to share electrons and create a covalent bond or complete separation into ionic bonds. Um, the elements of the human body, as you will notice, reside mostly in this top half of the periodic table. Um, you don't have these really heavy elements in there. Um, in most part, uh, most of the ones that are going to be present are going to be these ones in red or pink. Um, these atoms, okay, so these four atoms basically make 96% of human body and a lot of the biological life. Uh, and these are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And as we go through today's lecture, you'll see why. Um, and then the remaining of the atoms are making up approximately uh, the remaining 4% of your total system. So there are 25 total elements on the periodic table that are found in biological systems or in life. Uh, majority of them being taken by these eight that are mentioned here. Okay. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more about the way bondings happen before we talk about biological systems and how they can uh, be influenced because of these interactions. So the first one that we're going to talk about a little bit more is the covalent bond that happens. Um, so we're going to use a very simple example of just two hydrogen atoms, each one containing a single electron. Now, while they are, they have equal number of protons and electrons, they still have an unstable outer shell because it's not full. And it likes to be completely full to be in its happy state. So to do that, these two uh, hydrogen atoms will come just close enough to interact in that outer shell and share that electron so that both of them can have about the, you know, uh, can have the shell full, that outer shell full for some part of the time. Now they don't want to get too close or they wouldn't be able to get too close because of those two protons that are in the central nucleus and they will repel each other if they get too close. They can't be too far away because then there'll be no interaction between them. There has to be some overlap of that outer shell. And so typically your bond length between these two atoms is gonna be 0 0.074 nanometer. That's the distance between the nucleus so that um, the outer shells can interact uh, with enough force to have that shared covalent bond while still maintaining enough distance between the nuclei to not cause a problem. Now, these unpaired electrons in those we call the outer shell that is uh, present in the atom, your valence shell, that valence shell, um, these unpaired electrons are the ones that are going to participate in these bonds to create uh, different molecules. Now, they can interact with each other through single bonds or through double bonds. In a single bond, each of these atoms are going to create one interaction with the neighboring cell, as, uh, with the neighboring atom to create a single covalent bond. So you had those hydrogens, right? Each one can only make one bond. That's all it needs to create a full balance. And um, in this case, you're looking at a water molecule where there are two hydrogen atoms individually interacting with the water molecule, with the oxygen to create a water molecule. Uh, oxygen, if you go back to your uh, periodic table, requires two to get to a stable inert state, or not an inert state in this case, but to a stable full valence shell. Um, and so it's more likely to gain those two. And it does that by forming 
interactions with two hydrogen atoms to create a water molecule. And these are two single bonds, and that would be that 0 0.074 nanometer. Um, and then ammonia, again, the nitrogen requires three, so it, it has five already, and so it is going to take three interactions to get to that point. And a carbon, because remember, carbon has four and can make four interactions, will make four different interactions. So these give you the water, ammonia, and methane uh, examples. Now, you don't have to make a single bond. Cells can also make double or triple bonds, or not cells, atoms, I apologize. Atoms can also make double and triple uh, bonds. In a double bond, each one of your atoms that are interacting are going to have two electrons being shared between them. So in this case, in carbon dioxide, you have two oxygen molecules. Each one of them require two electrons to get to a full valence shell. And so each one of them is going to be sharing those two with two of the carbons. So with the, between the two oxygens, each one of the oxygen will contain will gain the two from the carbon to get to a full valence. And carbon in the center is going to be interacting with two oxygen, uh, two oxygen electrons from each one, making its full valence shell through that. And so that would be a double bond. Similarly, in a nitrogen, for example, you can create even a triple bond where two nitrogens, so this is just molecular nitrogen, um, can get together and share three electrons each, creating that full valence for each one of them. And so this would be a triple bond. Now, depending on how the bonds are formed, how many bonds are formed between, how many interactions are formed between each atom, the shape of the molecule can change. They have very specifically specific geometries depending on how many bonds are present and whether it's a single or a double or a triple bond. So here we have some examples of individual bonds which um, can happen between molecules. So here, uh, these are all examples in this case of single bonds where you have um, oxygen, nitrogen, or carbon and the different geometries that they can present as in that process. Down here you have a water molecule um, and you see how it has a very distinct uh, shape and this is partly because of the size of the individual atoms that are interacting as well as the charges that they are presenting between them. And we'll talk about that in just a few minutes as well. So um, the other part is whether it's a single or a double bond. Now, if you're just sharing a single electron, you tend to have a longer bond length and you tend to be a lot more flexible than if you have a double bond or a triple bond because the more interaction you have between two atoms, the more rigid that interaction, the more stronger in a way that interaction is going to get. And the bond lengths also reflect that. The bond lengths become shorter when it's a double bond or a triple bond. It will shorten even more. And the interaction is stronger, so it's going to be more rigid. It's not going to be as flexible. On the other hand, if it's just a single pair of electrons that are being shared between the two atoms, they're going to be a lot more flexible and they're going to be able to move around a lot more. It's going to be a, a, a much more a kind of flexible interaction compared to a, a stable and rigid interaction. Um, now, the shape, on the other hand, is dependent, like I said, on the size and the relative charge that the atoms get. In a interaction between two similar size and weight atoms, the interaction is going to be equal, quite equal, very, very equal, and the molecule is going to look pretty straight. So if you have two oxygen molecules interacting with each other, it's very likely that it's going to be just a straight molecule, right? Or it is going to be a straight molecule because both are exactly the same size and weight. On the other hand, when you're comparing oxygen to a water molecule, 
they're ways apart on the periodic table. One that only has one single electron and one proton and no neutrons, right? So it's a very small mass compared to an oxygen that has eight protons, eight neutrons, and that eight, you know, those six electrons are outside it or eight electrons outside it rather. So that's a lot of weight and there's a lot of electrons that are going to be creating a lot of activity and charge and energy. So in that case, um, the oxygen has the upper hand. So it's gonna be more likely to pull those electrons that it's so-called sharing between itself and the hydrogen. And it's gonna keep them in its orbit, which is obviously gonna be a larger orbit as well, a lot longer than the hydrogen gets to keep them in its tiny little uh, single orbit inside. So what it will end up creating is partial negative and a partial positive charge. So while it's not a full ionic bond, right? It's not that they separated completely. They're still having this interaction. They're still sticking together, but it's gonna be a little bit more towards the oxygen side. So the oxygen will be partially negative and the two hydrogens are gonna be partially positive and that's gonna create dipoles. Um, that's essentially your dipole that is created with a molecule and that's gonna give it a little bit of a different shape um, and where the hydrogens are kind of sticking towards this one side and the oxygen is towards the other. On the other hand, in a full ionic bond, um, it's a little bit different. The, in, it usually happens when you just have a single electron or uh, you know, a very different mass uh, difference between the two atoms that are interacting. Uh, so either there's just a single electron that needed to be transferred or a mass difference. And that will lead to the complete stripping of the electron from one of the atoms to the other. The biggest example of this is sodium chloride which can be found together where they're all kind of clumped together in a solid form. It's basically your table salt. But when you, as soon as you mix it in some liquid, they separate out into sodium ion and chloride ion um, so that a, each one of them has a full valence shell. But now your sodium has a positive one charge because it has one extra electron and chlorine has a negative one charge because it is uh, one more electron and sodium has lost its electron to chloride um, or chlorine. Now just uh, in addition to those, so you can have positive one, positive two, positive uh, three and same thing with the negative up to negative three charge uh, ions present out there. Now, other types of chemical bonds, um, which are neither covalent nor fully uh, ionic, also exist. These are usually uh, less strong, but they are extremely important in biological structure and function. Uh, and we'll talk about those more and more as we talk about different macromolecules and how they interact with each other. Uh, so you know, covalent bonds are still good. They're strong enough to stay and maintain within our biological systems, within ourselves. But um, they can also, you know, different molecules that have covalent bonds can also have other interactions in addition to them. One of those is hydrogen bonds. And so these hydrogen bonds exist when you have these kind of molecules that we just talked about where you have dipoles right where you have unequal sharing in a covalent bond. When you have unequal sharing between covalent bond, you create these dipoles where you have a partially negative and partially positive pole. And those poles can interact with each other as well. These type of interactions are very important in biological functions. Um, they are non-covalent bonds, they're non-ionic bonds, but they're essential in maintaining our structure and function inside the cells. So here is a diagram that kind of helps you see how some of these work. 
um, on one end are your nonpolar covalent bonds where neither atom has any charge. They are equal sharing of electrons between the um, different atoms that are interacting with each other. Then you have some polar covalent bonds. Polar covalent bonds are bonds where you have this partial sharing of electrons, but it's unequal and you create and partially negative and a partially positive end, as you see in ammonia or in water molecule. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you have your ionic bonds that are atoms with full charge, where there's a complete transfer of electrons from one atom to the other to provide both with complete valence shells. Um, in addition, you have non -co uh, you know, non-covalent non-ionic bonds. And there are four different types of weak interactions that can help bring molecules together inside the cells. Um, and these include your hydrogen bonds, Van der Waal uh, interactions, and Van der Waal interactions. Those are non-covalent weak interactions. And then you have your non-covalent ionic bonds and your covalent bonds. Um, and when you look at the length between the and these are obviously kind of average approximate lengths um, it will change somewhat depending on what type of atoms are interacting with each other but the bond lengths are going to be different if it is a covalent bond versus if it is a non-covalent um, weak versus strong interaction so in a non-covalent ionic bond as you see these um, have 0.25 that's bigger than that 0 0.07, you know, uh, bond length. This essentially also relates to the fact that they are going to completely separate at the end of the day. Um, your hydrogen bonds, on the other hand, if you look at the hydrogen bond, they are going to be in between your covalent and ionic bond uh, distance because they are going to be kind of kept together a little bit in that state because of these weak interactions between the uh, poles that they have. And then Van der Waals interactions are another type of interactions that happen between atoms that are in molecules that are far away from each other, but they are interacting and they are responding to each other as well. So these type of electrostatic interactions allow larger molecules to interact with the, uh, using these complementary charges. So within a larger molecule, you can imagine, which has lots and lots of atoms within them and lots and lots of different molecules, you have lots and lots of different areas with partial negative and partial positive and neutral charges. And these negative and positive charges are going to help build those larger structures together, are going to help bring them together through um, interactions between these bonds. Um, these negative poles will repel, the positive areas are going to interact with those negative ends, and they are going to be uh, together as a whole, even though individually those are weak forces, together as a whole, they'll be able to produce a very strong and specific bond between them. Now, biological molecules, a lot of times, like we said, are going to be mostly composed of these four atoms. A lot of it is carbon-based, and it carbon because of its versatility has a very unique role in the cells because it can make so many interactions with so many different things. And because of interacting with different molecules, it can make different shapes. It can be in a long chain right here. Um, and we would depict it in many of our diagrams that you see uh, as a zigzag. It could be branch trees, which is also depicted right here. Um, where there are carbon molecules interacting with each other and then interacting with other molecules as well. Or it can even form rings. Um, and this is obviously important. It is a small enough atom that it can bend and do things in different ways. It can make up to four different bonds. That makes it very versatile. And it usually makes really strong covalent interactions with small molecules, not larger atoms, but smaller atoms. This allows it to create a very stable skeletons that things can bind to and make structures from. 
So because of those properties, um, it's ideal for biological chemistry on Earth. It's also, um, you know, you have a lot of it present around you as well. The second atom that is going to be interacting with carbon, with these carbon-carbon structures, is hydrogen. And together, carbon and hydrogens make very stable compounds, or, and these group of compounds are called hydrocarbons. They're nonpolar because uh, they don't form any hydrogen bonds, any of those weak interactions, and they are generally insoluble in water because of their structure, because they're nonpolar, and water is very polar because of uh, the dipoles. Um, these molecules, however, are very stable, so just visible light is not going to have enough energy to break these bonds, which can be a problem with some of the other structures that we will see. UV light can break some of these bonds and create damage, but again, it's not going to be to the same um, way, to the same level as with some of the other uh, structures. Finally, uh, you can add other components because it can make those multiple bonds. You can add additional components to the hydrocarbon skeleton to increase its solubility and to increase or decrease its reactivity. So remember that simple hydrocarbon structure is going to be inert, right? It's not going to be very reactive. But you can add to you know one of the areas something else, like a hydroxyl group, which will create an alcohol or an aldehyde, which will make a carbonyl. But those type of bondings will increase its reactivity and increase its solubility by changing it from a nonpolar to a partially polar structure. Um, you can also add carboxylic acid to uh, or a carboxyl group. Um, and in that case, it will lose that extra hydrogen um, in water and make a partially negative ion as well. Uh, you can have esters that are formed in uh, by combining an alcohol with the acid uh, to create another structure that will provide you with more water. So there are lots of things that can happen with these carbon-oxygen compounds when you add just an oxygen to it, right? In addition, you can also take these hydrocarbon structures and add uh, nitrogens to them. When you add nitrogens, there are two main compounds that form. You have amines and amides, and these can um, help you form ring structures that are extremely important, as we'll see in, again, a lot of our biological molecules, including DNA. That's one of the ways that you will get your bases, the bromidines, and purines. Now, the second part of our biological chemical reactor system, I'll call the cell. So you have your carbon compounds, and then you have water. That is your universal solvent in these biological system. Water is great uh, at being a good solvent because, again, of, because of its properties. It's relatively small in size. It has partially negative and positive poles, really strong negative and positive poles because of the disparity in size of the oxygen versus the hydrogen atoms that it interacts with. Um, you can combine together, or they can kind of form sphere or hydration rings around ions uh, and keep them separate. So you have these hydration of sodium and chloride ions. And you can see how those interactions make different shapes depending on whether it's a positive ion or a negative ion. Um, it will dissolve a lot of hydrophilic compounds uh, or all the hydrophilic compounds. And then you will have some compounds that will not be mixable or not be soluble in the water. And those are going to be called your hydrophobic compounds. And these hydrophobic compounds can then be separated to create spe specialized structures like membranes. Um, so hydrophilic compounds, basically, or hydrophilic molecules, will readily dissolve in water. That's why they're called hydrophilic. Uh, these are going to be your ion compounds. So any of the ions that we are working with, any polar molecule that we're working with, those will all be uh, mixable or soluble in water. Uh, and when uh, they are there, they are going to provide it with additional properties. 
On the other end are your hydrophobic compounds, like your hydrocarbons. Um, those are any of the nonpolar compounds. Those are not going to be soluble in water, and they are not going to allow for any mixing within them. And like I said, that property itself can be used to create additional structures with specialized function. Now, um, when water interacts with air, uh, it forms uh, it forms interactions with it because, again, of polar nature of the water molecule, that gives two spe very special forces um, and specific properties to the water. It provides it with some structure and uh, it provides it with some surface area that can be utilized for other things. So there are two molecule, uh, there are two types of properties that you should be aware of: adhesion and cohesion. Adhesion is the water's ability to interact with whatever it is in. Um, so, for example, if it's in a glass tube, it's the interaction between the water molecules and the glass, and that's going to pull it up on the sides. So that's why you see that meniscus, because of those pulling to the side as it interacts with the outer edge of whatever you um, think it's in. And the second property is cohesion. And that is essentially the interaction of the water molecules at the surface to form hydrogen bonds with whatever is above it. And this allows it to resist the upward pull from the adhesion and be more form more of a latex, a lattice structure. And that lattice structure is then maintained as it gets frozen down. Because of this, the surface of the water molecule is actually um, able, uh, it has some structure to it, and that it does, doesn't have to be broken, right? Uh, some insects, many insects, and many objects can still walk across it or interact with it without falling into the water because of the way they are uh, working on it, and it does not break that surface structure and does not um, let them fall inside it. This lattice structure that you're seeing inside is all because of hydrogen bonding. So even though hydrogen bonding itself is super weak individually, when you combine it together between all the molecules that are present there and all that hydrogen bonding combined creates a very strong um, surface tension, very strong structure. And that um, is the importance essentially of that hydrogen bonding. It's responsible for many properties of water, including that surface tension that allows insects and many light objects to walk or glide across its surface, um, and also uh, allows it to have really high specific heat capacity and high heat of vaporization. So when you look at this in a water molecule in ice, you're going to see that lattice structure completely in full form, uh, frozen together, so you can see these little uh, rings forming in that structure. In a liquid form, you won't see the full lattice form because the water molecules are always mobile, but they are constantly making these interactions, making for that really strong strength. And then um, because these are still mobile, it's going to be uh, more dense than when it is in a very rigid, strict structure, which is why you end up with ice floating on water instead of sinking in water. Now looking at what can be put in there, what interacts with it, um, you can make both acids and bases through interaction with water and other molecules. So acids are substances, and this should be mostly a review. Um, acids are going to be your substances that uh, release hydrogen ions or protons when they interact with water. So for example, a very strong acid is hydrochloric acid. When in water, it's going to break up into the two ions, hydrogen ion and chloride ion, and that's going to make for a very strong acid. You can also have some weak acids, and those are going to be the ones that are more important in biological systems because of presence of carboxyl groups and a lot of biological molecules, those carboxyl groups break apart from the hydrogen as well, creating a weak acid. All of uh, In this case, this is going to be a reversible reaction where it can come back together as well. 
On the other end of the spectrum, you have bases. And bases, such as ammonia, combine directly with the hydrogen ions to create ammonium ions um, or hydroxyls. And those, uh, they can be you know, reduced or um, they can combine with hydrogen ions. And in that case, you are creating a weak base that's going to have a pH above 7. So sodium hydroxide, which is a very strong base, um, breaks up into sodium ion and a hydroxyl ion in water, giving you that basic function. Mm. So this is going to be true of, again, a lot of your biological compounds that have the amino group on them or amine group amines on them. They have a weak tendency to reversibly interact with the hydrogen ions from water, creating hydroxyl ions. Or not hydroxyl and ions, but they'll have releasing hydroxyl ions in because of that. So you have these amino groups that take away weakly that hydrogen ion, leaving behind, you know, uh, the hydroxyl as the result. So these type of hydrogen ion exchange happen spontaneously inside uh, water or aqueous environments. And these create two ionic species. So here is an example of that, right? You have the hydronium and hydroxyl ions, even when they're two water molecules just interacting with each other. Um, and so this is how it would be written, uh, because this is a reversible reaction. You have it going both ways. And it is equal at equilibrium just happening all the time. It's rapidly reversible. Uh, it just happens at a, you know, and so you'll have equal amount of hydrogen and hydroxyl ions present inside a water molecule, giving it a neutral pH, which is a pH of 7. And anything that is below 7 is going to be acidic. Anything above 7 is going to be basic. A lot of our, um, you know, things um, are acidic, so it gives you our stomach acid is highly acidic. It's a strong acid. Um, black coffee, right? Urine, all of those have acidic properties. On the other hand, seawater um, or looking at bleach, caustic soda, all those things are basic. So it goes from 0 to 14, um, with 0 being extremely acidic and 14 being extremely basic and neutral being water. So we'll stop here for this one. And in the next part of this lecture, I will be talking about small molecules and cells, uh, where we will start to now look at the combination of these carbon compounds and look at how they can be used to create the four major families of organic molecules found in our cells and how they function.